I want to thank everybody for being here today um, and taking an opportunity to listen to some of the nation's leading experts when it comes to water. My name is Jeremy Wyrick. I'm the clerk for uh, the uh, Senate's Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and I work for Senator Shelby. Um, when it comes to flood, droughts, storm surges, um, anything weather-related hazards, that is a big deal for appropriations. Um, whether we fund the uh, the three annual appropriations, whether operations or atmospheric research, or when we have to deal with the uh, devastating disaster responses through periodic supplementals. Um, we, we pretty much have a heavy hand on a regular basis on this. So Senator Shelby, from his perspective, um, sees the dev devastating impacts water can have, but also the potential we have, whether it's the sudden, sudden incidences, but sort of the long-term effects that we have to deal with when it comes to drought. So really appreciate everybody coming on up here today to, to uh, provide your expertise and thoughts on this. Because um, we have a good group of folks today from uh, academia, government, and private sector. And this effort today was led by the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, UCAR, um, in its activities in the newly established National Water Center down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So I want to welcome and thank um, UCAR President, Dr. Tony Buslaki, uh, for organizing this briefing and to uh, bring everybody here today. So thank you very much, sir, for coming on up. Very good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Buzalaki, and I'm the president of the University Corporation for Atmosphere Research. Um, and as you know, uh, UCAR is based in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and we manage on behalf of the National Science Foundation, the National Center for Atmosphere Research. Um, UCAR, as a not-for-profit corporation, has about 109 university members uh, in North America that are focused on research and training in weather, water, atmospheric sciences, and earth system science in general. And UCAR supports and extends the capabilities of our academic partners through NCAR and via our uh, UCAR community programs activities. Uh, not only does NCAR have world-class talent, scientific talent, we also host world-class scientific facilities. And what's shown up here is one of them is our Gulfstream 5 aircraft. Uh, that we use for uh, atmospheric measurements in field programs. This is a platform supported by the National Science Foundation. And two weeks ago, when NOAA's Gulfstream 4 aircraft was out of commission, we scrambled our platform in a matter of 10 days, and we're very pleased to be able to support uh, NOAA's hurricane reconnaissance mission at that point in time out over the Pacific Ocean. And it's observations from this particular aircraft that have been shown to increase hurricane track forecast by about 15%. Now this afternoon, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedules, especially this time during the calendar year, to learn a bit more, as Jeremy said, about the country's water needs and the steps that the nation is taking, our scientists across the government, industry, and academia, to better understand and identify the water-related issues and challenges facing us as we go forward. So be it Ellicott City, Baton Rouge, West Virginia, over the past several months, we've seen how important and devastating this particular topic is. For those of you that I have met, welcome uh, once again. It's a pleasure to see you here. For those that I have yet to meet, meet, please reach out to me or the UCAR team if you have any questions with respect to weather, atmospheric sciences, or scientific questions that are pertinent to your particular um, district. I would like to thank Senator Shelby for sponsoring this event and for his staff for their outstanding support of bringing you all here today. In particular, I'd like to thank Jeremy Wyrick for his opening remarks, as well as Cola Rathburn and Bethany Carter for their assistance uh, in supporting this event. The staff at UCAR and NCAR are really excited to be able to support the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I had the privilege about a month ago of visiting that facility, and it really, as you'll hear, it really is a world-class uh, facility, and as well as being part of the team that supports this national water model that you'll be hearing more about. Um, as, we'll, as we'll discuss, this really is going to be a game changer with respect to our predictive capability for stream flow and floodings and droughts going forward. And so with that, I'd like to kick things off and welcome to the podium Ed Clark, who's the Director of Geo Intelligence Division uh, within NOAA and the National Water Center. Ed? Great, thank you. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Gusalaki. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, although I would be honest with you, uh, I am very enamored with the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa. It's hard for me to leave. Um, let me find my slides here. The, uh, the conversation we're going to have today is really about uh, partnerships. Uh, partnerships not just with um, my colleagues here at the table that represent um, the various research, academic, uh, private sector aspects, but partnerships across the federal government as well. There are over 26 different federal agencies that have a role in water prediction, water management, water data sciences, and water data services. And what we know are, are describing as our transformation of water, water resources, water, water intelligence, really taps into all of that, as well as the breadth and spectrum of the academic research um, and, uh, and private sector communities. As I talk about the transformation of NOAA and NOAA's water resources prediction capabilities, we're going to focus on the newly launched National Water Model. This system came online on August 16th of this year and really is a representation of an effort across multiple federal agencies and, of course, with our research partners. A few to uh, highlight here, the U.S. Geological Survey, their Office of Surface Water, the and Core Sciences, the Environmental Protection Agency, of course, our friends and colleagues at uh, University uh, Corporation for Atmospheric Research, and the National Center for Atmospheric uh, Research. And then, uh, not, not to say the least of our partners in the academic community, organized for the uh, Corporation for the Advancement of Hydrologic Sciences, Dr. Richard Hooper will speak to that. And then, of course, my colleagues within NOAA, the National Center for Environmental Prediction. All of these folks have come together to launch this national water model to create a national framework for uh, a new era of water and water resources information. I don't think I need to tell this group why water, is so, water, water information is so important. We face a multitude of threats in this country, and it is growing exponentially by the year. This is compounded by population growth and economic development that are stressing water supplies and, and increasing the vulnerability to those supplies. We're seeing a change in climate and climate signals, increasing, increasingly impacting water availability, quality, and increasing the uncertainty in those precious natural resources. We have an aging infrastructure. U.S. Uh, American Society of Civil Engineers uh, rates infrastructure every year, and the infrastructure for water and water delivery uh, services ranges from a D to a C minus, a growing threat and one that which is informed and influenced by a better set of environmental intelligence. And finally, as we've seen most recently in the so southern portion of the U.S., spanning from Texas through Louisiana, uh, there are increasing socioeconomic risks with floods. Uh, and then, of course, in the U.S., western U.S., droughts are an ever-present growing and almost permanent fixture to the landscape. These water extremes range from floods and droughts. And they are recently identified as national, national security issues by the National Security Agency, National Security Council, I apologize. Also, or if not equally as important, is the emerging threats to water quality. This year we've seen uh, harmful ecological uh, algae blooms in the western U.S. along the coast of California, the ever-present challenges on the Gulf Coast on uh, Florida, as well as the Atlantic Coast, and then the traditional hypoxic challenges that are faced throughout the uh, Mississippi Delta region. These emerging water quality challenges necessitate a new way of doing hydrologic predictions and hydrologic modeling that my colleagues today will speak to. We are also facing external drivers to evolving and transforming, transforming NOAA and the National Weather Services hydrologic services. In 2012, the National Academies of Science released a report, Weather Services of the Nation Becoming Second to None. And for those of us who have grown up in the hydrology program of the National Weather Service, this was a hard pill to swallow. The, it was relatively damning on our technology, our current capabilities, which provide today 4,000 forecast uh, locations across the country. It ranges from days out to uh, approximately a full water year. The recommendations from the report implored us to improve pathways for collaborations and accelerate our research operations, and the National Water Center plays a key role in doing just that. It implored us to look at new predictive capabilities, new modeling investments, bringing us up to speed with the atmospheric science community, adding new hydrologic uh, techniques for modeling and data simulation that my colleague David Gotchis will speak to. And finally, a change in the culture, infusing new talents, new techniques, bringing youth back into uh, the, the, the realm of hydrologic science and water resources engineering. And Dr. Hoover will speak to how Quasi is doing that through a very exciting program that we host at the National Water Center called the Innovators Program and the Associated Summer Institute. 
Of course, if you take a look at our current services, uh, we were fortunate enough to have the freedom to change and to take um, new approaches because we have a robust network of forecasting in place. However, if you drive your eye to the white spaces across the, the map here, these are areas that do not lack, uh, that currently lack hydrologic forecasts today. Do the uh, the nature of our current modeling system is a calibrated engineering-based hydrology approach. These areas don't have the data um, because of the influences of tidal uh, uh, processes to allow the calibration of those hydrologic models. And so what that means is that these white spaces represent as about 100 million people, almost a third of the nation, that unlike the weather community, the atmospheric science do not receive a hydrologic prediction today. No guidance, no objective, no information. Launching the national water model closes that gap. This is part of NOAA's strategic initiative. It is a user-inspired, user-oriented water uh, revamp or reboot of the program. It aims to be interoperable, agile, and nimble, with a focus on integrated water prediction capabilities, decision support tools, and a new method, a new paradigm for service delivery. Five uh, key uh, components of this. We are closing the gap with the launch of the National Water Model and some of our key modeling capabilities, allowing us to have seamless atmospheric, hydrologic, and land surface processes, bringing that out to the coast that we will pursue in out-year uh, initiatives. It is a new era of expanded observations and data, and those of you who will attend the American Meteorological Society meeting this January in Seattle will know that uh, observations, the theme of this year's meeting is that observations lead the way. This is a key component to the investment that we're making in, uh, in NOAA's water initiative. Following that are enhanced research and development activities, integrated decision support tools, and enhanced service delivery. And all of these are uh, f uh, informed by social science, research into uh, uh, user analytics and research into human factors engineering so that the products and services, the tools and techniques that are part of this new initiative are, are relevant and meaningful to, to all, of our, all of our stakeholders. And finally, I'll close with a discussion of the National Water Center. This building was opened in May of 2015. It's a lead gold building. Um, it's approximately 60,000 square feet, located smack dab in the middle of the campus of the University of Alabama. Literally, we have students walking through the building trying to get to their classes, which is interesting. Um, it's a uh, building designed for uh, 220 people. We currently have staff of about 60. As important that that is for NOAA and the National Weather Service, it is equally, if not more important, that this is recognized as a federal interagency building. Today, we have seven U.S. Geological Survey employees in that building. We rotated through this summer a, a key member of the National Research Program from the USGS, a gentleman from the expert, with expertise in hydraulic analysis. And we have inroads with other federal agencies, including FEMA and interest from the Army Corps of Engineers, on routine and sustained collaboration in the center. For me, I spent 16 years in government. This building is as close to a Google-type environment that I will ever see. It is not a cubicle farm. It is open. It is collaborative. I have teams of, of folks huddling in corners, working on different projects, bumping into each other, and, and going to a break area to, to, to just explore and, and to push the science forward. Dr. Hooper will speak about how the center is used uh, to support that summer institute. And as we look forward to the National Water, to the national water Model's expanded capabilities, this will be the catalyst. This will be the hub of the improved uh, investments in the research uh, for the next generation of not only water science, but water data services. So let's introduce Dr. David Gotchis. He's a research scientist at the, universe, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And make no mistake, Dr. Gotchis is the father of the National Water Model. Probably the safest way to put it is that the National Water Model uh, now has many fathers and mothers and uh, people from all walks, and it's really been an honor and a privilege to be working on a project of, of this type and of this magnitude. Uh, as a scientist, as a research scientist, you don't always get this kind of opportunity to do something that impacts uh, your nation on a, on a grand scale. So uh, on behalf of our whole team, this is, this is really a, a great effort. I'm going to try to provide a very high-level description of what the National Water Model is. It's going to be a little bit technical in terms of some of the, uh, the details about uh, the size and the breadth of the model, but I'm not going to get into a lot of the, the scientific details of the formulations. There's plenty of documentation for that. This modeling system that was chosen to be the National Water Model is this modeling system called Wharf Hydro. It's a system that was incubated at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and has been invested by the National Science Foundation, uh, as well as other entities, both domestically and internationally, for uh, 
over 12 years now. So this uh, system has evolved over this, over this amount of time. It's a community-based supported water modeling system that is designed to provide adaptable representation of hydrologic processes, hydrologic processes on the land surface where people live and where they're impacted by water risks that Ed just mentioned. The system is de designed to assimilate real-time observations into it so that we can take observations of stream flow, such as what comes from the USGS, as well as other observations, bring that into the model, help keep the model honest, and then in turn provide predictions of key water cycle variables, things like precipitation, soil moisture, snowpack, groundwater, stream flow, and inundation, inundation being where flooded waters occur. And as you can see by the schematic here, we're really in the business of translating information, weather information, climate information, downscale onto the land surface to provide relevant hydrologic predictions for the nation. These are just some background statistics of what's composed within the model. In terms of data throughput, there's between uh, three and four terabytes of information of data that go in and out of the model every day. There are 2.7 million river channels that are represented within the National Water Model. Over 1,200 reservoirs uh, are parameterized right now. And if you combine all of the computational elements within the model, it's over 360 million computational elements. Some of the details in terms of the code, there's over 74,000 lines of code that have gone into this. So you can see that that wouldn't have been developed overnight. And it took a broad community of people to contribute to that uh, to get it to where it is. Each day we use over 100,000 CPU hours, so processors in a computer on NOAA's uh, secure centralized computer over at the INSEP facility in College Park, Maryland. And the last part there is that at present we're ingesting real-time stream flow observations from the USGS, and there's about 8,000 of those that report uh, around the clock every day. And those measurements are critical for keeping the model honest uh, and basically producing predictions of reasonable fidelity. The map you see over here is an official stream flow anomaly map. An anomaly is a departure from average conditions uh, from the entire channel network throughout the continental United States. This is a flow chart, or a diagram of how the different components of the modeling system are linked together. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail with this, but you can see how information is essentially flowing through the modeling system. We have a set of codes that start in the upper left, which basically take weather information from weather radar, from numerical weather prediction models that are run at NSEP, and we process that and get it ready for ingest into the hydrologic model. Going to boxes two, three, four, and five, that is the core guts of the hydrologic modeling system. There's a set of column vertical land surface processes which govern the exchange of moisture and energy to and from the atmosphere. That, in turn, is coupled to a routing module, which is run on a grid over the entire country at 250 meters. So there's a 250 meter spacing estimate of surface hydrologic conditions for the country that comes out of this. And that moves around overland flow. It moves around flow through the soils uh, and into the channel networks. The bottom two boxes basically show or illustrate how that information, that runoff information, is put into the river channel networks uh, for the entire nation. And then also in that last box, channel five there, where this data assimilation is occurring from the observational network that the USGS operates. The output of this, of course, are forecast products. And these products are what's critical to translating this information into actionable material, actionable intelligence. So I'm going to walk through now as quickly uh, as possible here some of the products that are being generated by the National Water Modeling System. Each day there are a set of analyses and forecasts that come out of the system. This particular graphic here is a depiction of soil moisture that comes out of the model. You can imagine a lot of different applications that people have in the interest of soil moisture for drought monitoring, for uh, agricultural applications and things like that. This particular map came from earlier this spring and you can see the patterns of wet versus dry soils mapped out across the country. This graphic here shows uh, an image of how much water is evaporating back to the atmosphere. So to have a, a water model of high fidelity, we need to know how much water that falls on the earth actually returns to the atmosphere. Uh, this is also important for several other critical applications, which include agriculture, how much water is being used by the, or sucked up by the atmosphere in terms of plant demand, uh, but also other applications like power cooling facilities. Uh, the evaporative demand by the atmosphere has a very big role on how much 
uh, how much water cooling capacity can come from those plants. And so estimates and forecasts of this have a role across a number of different sectors. For those who live in the western United States or across the northern part of the country, uh, snowpack is also a very important water resource. And so from the National Water Model, there are uh, continuously cycling analyses and forecasts of snowpack conditions on a one kilometer grid for the entire country. And this is critically important for looking at uh, how the sustainability of a lot of the water resources throughout the western U.S. Ed mentioned that a key aspect of the National Water Model is to provide water intelligence related to flooding, and this gets to this issue of inundation. What you see here is a national map of inundation uh, on the upper left. That graphic was taken from April 18th, 2016, which is the day after the Houston floods had occurred uh, this past spring. They got over 17 inches in less than 24 hours in the Houston area, and that caused quite a bit of flooding. Zooming in to this lower right-hand panel, you can see where these darker colors represent the depth of inundation, uh, both in the greater Houston area, but then extending up to the northwest through the river systems that were feeding into that area. And this is basically getting at trying to provide actionable information at those, scale, at those scales. Similarly, there is an estimate of the depth to soil saturation. We don't have a complete groundwater model in the National Water Model yet. That is a core development activity that will be undertaken by the interagency group that Ed mentioned. But we do have estimates of where our soils are being saturated. And that, of course, is very important for things like transportation, trafficability, agriculture, and the potential risk of future flood events. So putting everything together, uh, we come up with this national map. This was produced by Ed's group at the National Water Center. This is output from the National Water Model. You're looking at an animation of stream flow over about a two and a half month period on all 2.7 million river reaches from the country. This is the first time uh, for the U.S. at least that a product like this has been available. And you can see a lot of features happening in this. You can see weather systems moving across the country, generating precip, which creates stream flow. And then you can see flood waves sort of slowly moving down these river systems behind that. And this provides people who need to make water, key water resource and water emergency related decisions of a national view of what those risks and what the situational awareness may be at that point in time. Any user now can go on to the National Water Center's website, click on, an, click on a, a map like that, and get a stream flow forecast at every one of those 2.7 million river, river reaches. This is uh, a, several different kinds of forecasts that are produced. I won't go into the details of these, but suffice it to say, if you have a river that you're going to go boating on, you're going to go fishing on, that you know is prone to flooding, you can click on that river reach and get an analysis and a forecast on that river reach right now. This is a little case study that we did just to demonstrate uh, this particular aspect. This is an animation similar to what we just saw, but during the Hurricane Joaquin floods in the Carolinas of last year, there you see the main event happened. And what is interesting to look at is not only do we have a large number of channels responding to that heavy flood event, you get a sense of how long that event took to unwind, how long those flooded waters took to basically recede, and how much uh, impact that could have had in that region for uh, response activities. So starting to wrap up now, this is really what we're talking about in terms of this transformation of service. This is a couple of maps from Texas, what you see on the left-hand side over there is a map of Texas, uh, most of central and southern Texas, and those are the existing forecast points for which forecasts are currently made, and they're, they're done very well. What's going on right now with the new national water model is you have this other depiction, this more spatially continuous depiction, which gives forecasters an additional tool. It's an additional set of guidance on where the hydrologic risks are going to be, how long they're going to last, and how severe they might be. Where are things headed? Our top priority in terms of future model development right now is really in advancing the skill and the fidelity of the model to improve water predictions. And one of the biggest ways we can do that is by improving the representation of human activities in the nation's water systems. So this includes the representation of water management and reservoirs and river systems, but it also includes other imprints of humans such as landscape change due to agriculture, urbanization, and then also uh, the relative impacts of a changing climate. To do all this, it's going to take more than one agency, more than one research group. Like I said, many fathers, mothers, aunts, and uncles are going to be involved in this. And we're going to move from building a model to building a community, a water prediction and a water intelligence community. 
And this happens through the sharing of perspectives and resources. It happens by engaging not only scientists, but for practitioners and decision makers at every step in the way to make sure nothing's left on the floor, no knowledge is left on the floor, no data is left on the floor, and no risk is unaddressed. To do that, we'll need to build a better observation network, and that's going to take a multidisciplinary team of people to figure out what that's going to look like. And lastly, we need this, this basic team, this large team, to revolutionize public access to this kinds of water intelligence. And that's where the key partnerships with the academic community and the private sector are going to come into play. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Rick Hooper of Kawasi to talk about some of these academic engagement activities. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rick Hooper. I'm the President and Executive Director of QUASI. That's the University Consortium for Hydrologic Sciences. Just as Dr. Busalaki talked about UCAR, QUASI is another NSF-funded university consortium uh, for the hydrologic sciences. So I'm here today to really talk about how we're using the national water model, in fact, how it holds the potential for really transforming the way we do our hydrologic research and how we interact with the federal agencies. The, hyd the National Hydrologic Model from, or National Water Model from my perspective is actually this framework for collaboration. It's providing what we call a hydrofabric, uh, uh, this 2.7 million reaches you've been he hearing about, helps to um, give a com common reference point for hydrologists to work together with atmospheric scientists. This is an unprecedented kind of uh, bridge that we can then uh, go between the atmospheric sciences, the hydromet community, into the hydrology community. And because water touches so many different disciplines, having this picture, this detailed picture of water movement across the continent also supports a, a broad range of interdisciplinary research, everything from aquatic habitat through water supply, um, to agricultural uses, et cetera. So it's a very important framework that allows many different scientists to collaborate. Furthermore, uh, Ed had talked about a research to operations uh, pathway. This is a really important aspect as well because uh, typically hydrologists have worked at relatively small scales. That's where we do our science where we can collect the more detailed data. Hydrology in Delaware is different from hydrology in Arizona, and it allows, this National Water Model Framework allows us to explore those differences of what are the, what are the dominant processes in these different areas, and we can talk about regionally specific hydrologic mechanisms. But then, very importantly, it's something that the Weather Service can evaluate for inclusion into the National Water Model, how they want to deal with that. And this becomes, therefore, a test bed for different process representations that the research community can use and the Weather Service can harvest. Um, I think another really important thing for me from the hydrologic side is it provided a different view of hydrology where we see the river continuum. That, that uh, animation that, that Dave showed uh, shows this continuity, if you will, from the, the sky to the sea, right, that, that we have this plumbing um, that we see across the continent and have this more integrated view. And that's quite revolutionary. So it's a really different way of thinking about things that has this, this high resolution capability that we can do with the kind of computing power we have today. Moreover, this provides a, a detailed um, prediction uh, of the transport layer of surface water moving across the continent for a whole range of, of, of uses. Uh, Ed had also mentioned about the Summer Institutes. We, uh, the National Weather Service, has funded Quasi to help organize uh, Summer Institutes in 2015 and 2016, which were intensive seven-week, uh, um, yeah, institutes down at uh, the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa. Uh, roughly 35 graduate students each year uh, were involved, and it really provided a, both an incredibly important research experience for the next generation of scientists, um, but as well, it allows uh, us to try different proof of concepts. We could try different ideas out uh, using the national water model. So let me give you one example of this from this past summer in 2016, where the uh, group of scientists, now this is uh, led by scientists at Utah State University, University of Texas at Austin, and the University of Illinois. So again, this is what Quasi does, is bring together universities from around the country uh, to work in a different way of thinking about how do we do flood inundation mapping. Uh, and in the past, we've always looked at this on a cross-sectional basis for th with inundation mapping. This time, the scientists said, well, can we think about the problem differently? Can we sort of take a continental top-down view of stream hydraulics and in flood inundation by combining the catchments and flow lines that exist in the national water model with the digital elevation model to create a new kind of coverage called the height above nearest drainage as the basis for the routing of water through the river network. 
This was attempted in this past summer and was explored to show that there, it did have distinct possibilities. An important aspect of these summer institutes is actually they also involved the emergency response community. So we were working and we had the students talking with the first responders about what the kind of information they needed. And so one of the things we did was a, a, a sample down in Alabama of this inundation mapping. And it was really important to have the firemen sitting there saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you got that right. This part, of the, this part really does flood. And you, that looks, this looks about right. So it passed an initial sort of sniff test. If you look at the number of mapped reaches now using the old flood mapping way, it's a, very, it's a relatively small number, about 130. Um, whereas this would then be a comprehensive mapping of the entire continent. So this is not a proven method yet. This is an idea, but it's an idea that we can then pass off to the Weather Service to have them evaluate whether this is appropriate then for uh, implementation in the operational model. That's kind of the power of this connection of research to operations. Looking forward, uh, as I think uh, Dave mentioned, a, an important thing is to expand the, uh, the representation of groundwater processes. A key aspect there is including the deeper aquifers, which really aren't represented in the model today. Uh, but that's quite a challenge as well. These are, this is uh, something which has been uh, uh, an area of active research of how we do these, uh, to do the integrated modeling between groundwater and surface water. But clearly it's very important if we're going to use the model for understanding drought. Also, water routing. We have to move beyond just routing the floodway through the system to be able to track the parcels of water through the system. And that's going to be critical with the water chemistry applications that previous speakers have mentioned. From the hydrology community, which again typically has worked at small scale, looking at this at continental scale enables us enables us to incorporate new data, new NASA satellite data, such as the GRACE um, groundwater data and the SMAP soil moisture data. Another important bridge that the next speaker, Dr. Manuel, will speak to is how we use um, the national water model to, again, translate work that's done at small scale to explore its implications at larger scale. So we have a number of research catchments uh, that are operated by the National Science Foundation, by the Forest Service, USDA, Department of Energy, USGS. Typically, where we do this very detailed work, which allows us to overturn maybe existing ideas of how hydrology works, is at small scale. This national water model then provides an approach to be able to uh, translate those, resources, those re research results up to a larger scale. And to give you an example of that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ryan Emanuel from North uh, Carolina State to talk about some of this research. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today about research in ecohydrology, which is an area uh, of science that focuses on interactions uh, between water and life, so interactions between hydrology and ecosystem ecology. This type of work that's conducted at research institutions across uh, the U.S. and the world is important because it uncovers insight and process details about environmental processes that can then feed into models uh, like the, uh, the, the modeling work discussed here. So in a nutshell, ecohydrology, as I said, is the interaction basically between water and life. We all understand that water influences ecological processes and patterns. So whether we're talking about forest health, crop productivity, uh, soil quality, or other ecological phenomena, water is a critical part of this. So ecohydrology dives a little deeper and looks at things like the intensity and frequency of precipitation and how they drive ecological patterns and processes. Similarly, it looks at the lateral redistribution of water in the soils and how does that, uh, how does that influence patterns that we see on the landscape. Uh, Ecohydrology also looks at the atmosphere's demand for moisture and how plants respond to that demand and influence the amount of water that's available in the soils for other purposes. So along these lines, ecosystems also influence water quantity and quality. Trees remove water from the soil, send it back to the atmosphere that has a distinct imprint on the amount of water that's left over for humans and natural ecosystems downstream. Uh, one central tenet of ecohydrology, though, is that these interactions are constantly interplaying with one another. So when we think about these systems, we think about them holistically, that hydrological processes and ecological processes are constantly in interaction and motion and feedback. I'm going to give you some examples of the type of work that we do in the field. Uh, and I want to point out that most of this work, uh, because I'm at an academic institution, is conducted by students supported by the National Science Foundation.
So Tenderfoot Creek Experimental Forest is a field site that I'm going to share with you today. This is in central Montana, uh, characteristic of much of the northern Rocky Mountains. Uh, lodgepole pine forest draped in snow several months of the year. Uh, the map here shows you uh, distribution of several heavily instrumented watersheds. You can see a list of the types of instruments that we have in these watersheds. The photographs show you some of the tools, technologies, and measurements that we, le that we leverage to make very detailed, very intensive measurements of uh, water and ecological processes across this landscape. So the first example that I'm going to share with you has to do with water availability and carbon cycling in this landscape. Uh, we have a tower in this landscape that, that makes a continuous measurement of carbon dioxide exchange between the forest and the atmosphere above. And so you can see here year over year fluctuations in carbon uptake that represent carbon sequestration and storage in this forest. That's the figure on the top panel there. The middle panel shows you water lost uh, evaporated back to the atmosphere from this same forest over the same six-year period. The lower panel shows soil water uh, fluctuating year over year in rhythm with these patterns of carbon exchange and water exchange. And so the important take home from this is that soil water really drives these patterns of carbon and water cycling in this environment. Further, these forests actually influence their hydrologic environment by removing water from the soil. So the duration of the growing season, the heat of the growing season, how much snowpack you have at the beginning of the growing season uh, is critical to, uh, to informing how much water is going to be left over at the end of the growing season and then potentially available in the next year. A second example has to do with forest health. So in the Mountain West, a major issue over the past decade or so has been uh, mountain pine beetle. Uh, so we observed mountain pine beetle at Tenderfoot Creek several years ago, and we combine uh, high-resolution satellite imagery with airborne laser altimetry and hand handheld imaging technology to actually fingerprint, collect optical fingerprints of the health of in representative trees in this environment. So these figures show you what these optical fingerprints look like. We took this information and combined it with high resolution satellite imagery in order to map out the distribution of pine beetle infestation across this landscape. So we generated extremely high resolution maps of the early onset of pine beetle in this forest. And what we were able to do is combine this information with other high resolution information about terrain and topography, and we were able to see that pine beetles first invade portions of this forest that are uh, subject to water stress, located in drier landscape position, and this illustrates the tight connection between water availability in these types of landscapes uh, and the health of these forests. So the final example I'm going to share with you about our, model, or about our work at Tenderfoot Creek is a, a modeling study. This is much finer scale than what you've seen so far today. This is a, about a five square kilometer uh, watershed where we combine observations of water vapor losses with information about where trees are located on the landscape in order to map the distribution of soil water throughout the growing season. So what you see here is a progression of three snapshots from our model. Early during the snowmelt season, you can see the blue showing the, the soils beginning to saturate across this watershed. During peak runoff, so the height of the runoff and snowmelt season, you see much of the watershed saturated with water. Late in the summer, you see the watershed dry. And what this work shows us is that the unique combinations of uh, vegetation and terrain on the landscape combine to influence patterns of soil water, and those soil water patterns influence how much runoff is available to humans and natural ecosystems downstream. So where do we take this? Uh, Long-term data from the U.S. Geological Survey shows that stream flows are changing in the United States. In some places, like parts of the American West, we see gradual declines in both minimum and maximum stream flows. In other places, like uh, the high eastern highlands, the Appalachian Mountains, we see a broadening of the envelope of variability. So high flows are getting higher, low flows are getting lower. Uh, these USGS data complement modeling efforts, and they, they show us that um, that, that these trends are really important, but uh, eco-hydrology and the, the processes that we investigate at small watershed scales have the ability to, to pull the veil back and help us understand what's driving these trends. 
So I also want to talk about the impacts on indigenous communities in the United States. These maps show on the left tribal territories in the United States, and on the right, the distribution at the county level of indigenous populations. 500, over 500 federally recognized tribes and dozens of state recognized tribes uh, have particular uh, values associated with specific places, and many of those places are water related. Uh, these communities are also especially vulnerable to water related disasters, catastrophes, and so forth. I will show you a couple of examples as I wrap up here. Uh, so the, US, the American Southwest is in the midst of chronic drought. In the midst of that drought last year, uh, over 3 million gallons of mine waste was released into a tributary of the San Juan River, wreaking havoc on the Navajo Nation, even in the midst of this drought. Uh, just last Friday, federal agencies paused work on an oil pipeline in North Dakota, where it's slated to cross underneath the Missouri River less than a mile from the Standing Rock Sioux uh, Reservation's water intake. My own indigenous community, uh, is, uh, the, the Lundy community, is actually suffering potential impacts on water quality in our namesake river due to population growth and pressures associated with uh, food and energy production. Uh, despite the diversity of values across indigenous communities and despite the, um, the wide range of, of problems uh, that these communities experience, uh, one common thing remains that water is sacred. Uh, and water is, is life. And with that, I'll introduce uh, John McHenry from Barron Services. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. We're uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, I want to thank, thank uh, Senator Shelby for making this possible and uh, the, 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 the panelists that uh, have come before me for giving you a wonderful overview of, uh, of the National Mo Water Model. And um, uh, I am here uh, representing the private sector. Um, Barron Services is a, uh, a company that was founded in the late 1980s by Bob Barron as a result of a tornado that came through Huntsville, Alabama. And so we couldn't be uh, more proud to have the National Water Center uh, in, our, uh, in our great state. Uh, on the campus uh, uh, down in Tuscaloosa. Uh, we, we partner with industry, government, and the research community. And by partnerships, uh, I mean things like uh, federal contracts, uh, business to business, uh, sale, uh, sales of products and services, in particular decision support systems. Um, and um, with the academic research community, such as NCAR, uh, in, de in developing uh, and deploying operational modeling systems uh, internationally. Um, for, by example, um, uh, under contract to, to NOAA, uh, we help develop and then deploy uh, new radar technology, weather radar technology that has just come online in the last three years, upgrading from single polarimetric to dual polarimetric uh, radars, giving our nation uh, a, a much uh, better sense of, of the information that you can derive from radar uh, for weather, weather uh, kinds of situations. We were also the first company to make it possible to put radar on TV back in the early 1990s. So Barron may not be a common household name uh, as, a, as a weather company, but I think we're representative uh, of the private sector in general, which is a large and healthy industry, but it also depends upon uh, the federal agencies, and it depends upon the research community uh, for our livelihood. And I, I like to think vice versa because of the role that we play uh, in communicating uh, weather-related disasters. Now, flood disasters are important, but they haven't really had um, the, uh, the kinds of technology that allowed us to, uh, to, to have an integrated uh, view uh, of, of the entire river network in a, in a, in a full country, uh, uh, especially the size of the United States, up until today, even though there's been a dramatic increase in the number of flood disasters. And because flood-related disasters top the list as the most frequent, our company is deeply committed. Uh, one of our earlier, our, our, our tagline now is critical weather intelligence. But prior to that, it was, and, and this, it, it includes the, the prior tagline, which is technology and people committed to saving lives. Um, and we think the newly uh, deployed national water model is going to enable uh, our country to do just that. Uh, and that is why we forecast hydrological events, because floods far outweigh any other natural disaster 
in the number of people that are affected, uh, especially over the last decade. Now, there really are two segments. You can think about dividing it to, to a certain extent. It's a false division between industry and, and personal uh, assets. But the economy is up to two-thirds rather sensitive. Um, even more than that, even if you make products or develop products and, and services and, and your, your locale gets flooded, you may, your product or service may not be weather dependent, but your location is going to be flood dependent. And so if you can relocate your assets prior to the flood occurring by bringing truck, moving things out of your storage facilities, moving things out of your grocery store, uh, then you can save money. And the recovery can be faster and sooner. Uh, an example uh, from the Texas floods, um, which included the Fort Hood disaster, by the way, here's a flood in, a, in a, a, a shopping center with a Kroger. Now, if they'd known that was coming in advance, uh, at the level, the characterization of the flood, there probably was a flash flood warning, but they didn't know how deep it was going to get. So if they'd known that, they could have relocated before the flood happened. So that's, this is the type of promise that we think that the national water model has. Um, human life and property, it's also going to benefit from national water model results. Again, because as Dave pointed out, the national water model dramatically increases the number and the locations of lead times at which floods are forecast. Now, this little animation that's showing up here on, on the left is a research version of the WERF Hydro. Now, you'll hear WERF Hydro. What's WERF? Well, that's Weather Research and Forecasting Model. That's a model that's been developed over many years at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So this is the hydrological extension. So it's a coupled modeling system. And so for the first time ever, you can actually launch a model that integrates the entire stream flow network with the weather. So it's, it's sky through the water network to sea. Um, but this will allow folks to take life and property saving actions at times and locations they previously could not. And obviously, as a participant in the, in the national weather enterprise, which includes all of the sectors, we believe that we're vital to communicating these threats and, and warnings. Um, nearly 100% of US and Canadian, Canadian uh, cable homes are covered by technology that Barron has provided. We, uh, uh, we deploy 95% of your local dual Doppler radar systems that your TV station uses and then streams back to the internet. So that's a whole lot of technology that we deploy. Now we haven't had, we, and, and you can see it at the radar scale. You can see those storms coming. But you, can't, you have not until now been able to see the hydrology at the radar scale. Where the streams are, are, are at that one kilometer scale, at that 250 meter scale, where your little local neighborhood stream may overflow. My wife and I ran into a situation in our neighborhood recently in Raleigh. We had four or five inches of rain in two hours. Well, our local little stream flowing through our neighborhood, which is usually only about a half a foot deep, well, we had a, about a foot of water, and we had to turn around. And thankfully, my wife was you know, watching because, well, anyway, you know the story, right? Uh, but anyway, we, we, we put together tools like this App Messenger, which is a smartphone tool. This one in particular allows emergency management agencies to actually configure it in a way that its users can get the detailed type of information out to the local first responders and uh, the, uh, and, per, and, 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 and the general public. And we think that including national water model results in this type of um, applications, smartphone applications, streaming applications, getting that information out is going to be critical. Now, why are we standing up here? We're standing up here because we had an initial investment in the WERF Hydro model in partnership with NCAR uh, in deploying an early version of that uh, with an international contract. And so our scientists work together with NCAR scientists, um, and we've continued to, um, to um, uh, communicate and collaborate as time has gone on. Um, and we're very proud of that. But in, in conclusion, uh, a couple of points to take home. 
So the national water model is going to really dramatically increase the geographic coverage. You saw that in Ed's slides. 100 million people who are not covered will be covered at this point in time. The site-specific location, your neighborhood, those little streams that flow through, maybe the larger rivers like the Ellicott City that typically floods but not that much, those flood levels will be able to be better forecasted with this model. Uh, it ushers, it really is a paradigm shift. It uff, ushers in a new era in the availability of flood and flash flood forecasting. And both industry, through various creative methods like asset relocation, the general public, both, will benefit through a reduction in, in lives lost and in the cost to replace uh, property. And then finally, partnering with government agencies and the research community, companies like Barron, will be essential in timely communicating, timely communication. You'll get those forecasts most often over your cell phone or TV or streaming internet. Um, those results will become available in an integrated, uh, seamless fashion across the entire country. So I want to thank my esteemed panelists for the invitation to be here. Thanks, Senator Shelby, and thank you for coming. Thank you, John. Thank you to our panelists for an excellent summary of where we are. Look at this. A panel of scientists that finished early, all right? <laughs> and so that's illustrative of the, the rigor and the discipline being brought to this problem. <laughs> so in all seriousness, uh, we heard several times here mention of research to operations. And oftentimes, we actually say, what's well, the challenge of research to operations or the problem in crossing this valley of death? I think what you've heard here today is an excellent example of how this can work and how it should work in other areas. Uh, the NSF investment in basic research, leveraging off that investment in collaboration with a mission agency such as NOAA, collaboration with the larger academic community, collaboration with the private sector, and making this transition all the way from basic research, applied research, development of applications, supportive operations, and these guys here are not just done. Uh, now that this model is being run 24-7, this model is going to be continuously confronted with the observations, where it worked and where it doesn't work. And that's going to feed back to the research enterprise again, so the operations to research. And this is iteration back and forth is how we proceed. The other comment I'd like to make is, you know, we're all familiar with broadcast meteorology. We turn on the television at night. What you've heard here is going to actually usher in an era of broadcast hydrology, where you're going to be able to turn on the television at night and see forecasts, visualizations of street-level images of what's going to be happening in, in your neighborhood. So that's why I said at the beginning, uh, this really is going to be a game changer for which we're all going to benefit. And with that, I'd like to open it up uh, for questions for our esteemed panel. Please state your name. We have a microphone around, I believe. Who's in here? If I need somebody who knows how to. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ariana Skybell. I'm a reporter with Greenwire. Um, and in terms of flooding prediction, um, one of the biggest problems uh, in Louisiana right now was that a large percentage of homes that were flooded were outside the flood plain. Um, and FEMA is in charge of drawing those maps. So how can the national, national water model, um, how can you work with FEMA um, to more accurately predict flooding in a changing climate? Good. <laughs> so um, thank you for your question. The question was uh, regarding to how does the national water model interact with the regulatory floodplain maps. Um, right now, the, the answer is, is that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to validate and explore this model. What we're doing right now is hydrologic analysis, not hydraulic analysis. So today, the regulatory floodplain maps use tools like the Army Corps of Engineers HEC RAS uh, model to do that complex hydraulic analysis to bring water up and out of the channel. What I think can be a, a point of beginning the collaboration is to look at uh, the, the potential hydrologic analysis that's being regenerated by Dave 
by Dr. Gotch's group and look at the extremes that we've seen in the past and challenge some of the assumptions that are made in the underlying flow rates that are used in the generation of those maps. But there's a tremendous amount of effort that needs to be done to integrate predictive forecast capabilities that are of a lower order of magnitude in, um, in resolution to what is a regulatory product. I guess I would want to caution that this is not a solution for improved floodplain mapping and regulatory floodplain mapping, but is a predictive tool so that the response side, uh, the planning side, has a better set of, of where that floodwaters could be. I'll add one quick comment to that. Is that working? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, Southern Louisiana, Lower Mississippi River Basin is one of the most heavily plumbed regions in the world in terms of water management and control of, of water resources and, and river flow activity. And um, I pointed out earlier that, that what's one of the weaknesses in the first version of the National Water Model is not having sufficient representation of uh, the total imprint of humans on that. Uh, particularly when that infrastructure fails uh, in certain cases, uh, we have a compounded problem. It's going to take a while for us to get there, but that is the improvement of the National Water Model, its representation of the hydraulics that Ed mentioned, and the improvement in our ability to sort of reveal and represent those uh, water management infrastructures and the things that go on in that region is definitely a top priority for development. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll add one other thing too, is that the complexity in, in an integrated model like this one in terms of managed water um, really has to do with also interacting with reservoir managers because they are making real-time decisions about how to manage their uh, the, the, the levels of water behind their dams uh, in a way that they think is going to be optimal, not only for the you know the the the, the, da the, the dam design itself, but also for downstream populations that may be exposed. If the model is not aware of those decisions that are being being made in real time, then the model has little chance of getting the downstream flooding correct. So it's the interagency cooperation and collaboration that really makes this a much more important. Uh, and, and, and give it the potential that it has to be able to, to do what we think it will be able to do in the future. Just one other point, just conceptually, and maybe Dr. Mason can qualify anything I say here, but recognize that flood maps are uh, an issue of risk, right? That's the point. We're talking about just direct uh, prediction here. So the FEMA flood mapping process has a statistical component. And although we could be testing some of those ideas about statistics based upon repeated applications of this model, we recognize there is a difference here of, of how those flood maps are drawn. Mike? Yeah, uh, sorry. Okay, yeah, this is Michael Eck, National Weather Service. Um, Weather, water, climate is inherently global, and so I'm interested in how we can build uh, what we learned from the uh, water model into a more comprehensive or include that more broadly in, uh, in our full um, Earth system models. So I'm mean, just actually play on that, not just how, but what would be needed to do that to expand globally. Yeah, I'll start with that. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the question. It was basically how do we expand what we're doing here over the continental United States and basically over a large chunk of North America now and do that as a global service. I think there are a number of fundamental things that do need to happen in that and data set development is clearly one of the top things uh, on top of that list. And it's going to require a level of international cooperation and sharing of water information that is heretofore not really happened. Um, water is a sensitive uh, data in many countries around the world. The U.S. is quite liberal with their water data compared to most countries. Um, and so some of those barriers will have to be overcome. But we don't need to wait until those barriers are overcome. Uh, with NASA's global sort of satellite missions and what they're planning to do without going into details with what other nations around the world are doing in terms of building and sharing water information, I think we can get a good jump on this problem. And as you're suggesting, trying to tie the complete global water cycle together freshwater discharges to the oceans, global land evaporation back to the atmosphere so that hopefully we can ultimately create a better weather forecast, which turns into a better water forecast and the cycle goes on and on. Thanks, uh, Nathan, with the US Water Partnership. And this is really exciting. It's tremendous work, uh, so congratulations. And my question is, is more on the, um, the kind of the next steps in the communication of, uh, of the model. And I think you've, you've touched on it in some ways through 
uh, universities and collaborations and networks um, and reaching out to Native American communities um, and getting the feedback from first responders. Uh, but could you talk a little more about <clears throat> get, uh, getting the message out and more on the, you know, so it, uh, that, that actionable information is, is very kind of simple for a farmer to use. Uh, what are the different types of communities you're targeting? Um, and then I guess, how can the other, other players in the water sector help you with that messaging and communication? Because uh, you don't want to put everything on uh, the National Water Road or NOAA uh, in your groups, but i uh, curious on the, the next steps to, to do that. And the last bit of that is, um, you could also think of communities that are really under-resourced um, and don't maybe have the sophistication or the tools to interpret a lot of different maps and uh, and the, the full capability. So I know it's with the, the kind of the new uh, smart coast model. Um, you know, you don't have to be at the, the top level, but are there tiered approaches to, all right, here's a simple dashboard for, for using this. Um, so that kind of... And as you said before, it's an adaptive process. You'll hear the feedback. You'll make the changes. So it's what currently exists is not what's going to happen. Uh, but it was, it, based on the presentation, I'm really excited thinking about those next steps. So I'll let you respond in, in, in more detail. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I'm not going to try to repeat it back because it went <laughs> pretty involved. I'll start with the latter part and then I'll work back to to, the, to what we're doing to get the message out. Um, so, so right now, uh, I, I think this is really a key component of this partnership between the public, and private, and academic sectors. We are engaging with academia. We are engaging with social scientists in the academic sectors. But I think there's a tremendous value to be had by the private firms that can take output from the National Water Model and custom tailor that to individual communities, to individual sectors. NOAA has a relatively broad mission. We protect lives and property. Um, but some of these, these new information data sets uh, have implications for sectors that are profoundly served or better served by the private sector. And that's why working through groups like Barron Services, through our relationships with folks like Riverside uh, Technologies, there are ways to that this information that we can work with them to deliver better services to those individual communities and allow them to answer their specific decision support applications. Now, in terms of what NOAA is doing to follow up on this, this notion of the NOAA Water Initiative, as you all know, this summer uh, we held two regional list water listening conversations in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where the National Water Center is located, and also in California. We heard two profoundly different sets of requirements and information sets. The more humid regions of the country is focused on short-term floods, more gauges, more data, and in the western U.S. it's all about uh, drought uh, water supply forecasting. That was uh, then complemented by a session here in Washington, D.C., um, where uh, NOAA and other federal agencies uh, again sat down and listened to our stakeholders and laid out a, a series of what they told us were their priorities. Going forward, uh, the National Water Center does have a social intelligence division, a complement to my geointelligence division. And uh, my colleague, Peter Cullihan, is just now working on a series of activities to go back to some of the communities that we've, we've worked with in the past to have these types of uh, conversations, to prototype and to in, in, uh, take on these pilot projects, regional pilot studies uh, in areas of interest. So I don't know exactly how that's going to look, what that's going to look like, but these will be